Hey everyone, I'm Mark Sargent and this is Flat Earth Q&A emails number 87 where you send me your questions to msargent23 at comcast.net that's m-s-a-r-g-e-n-t 23 at comcast.net and I will try to answer them the best I can. Let's get right to it. The first one's called Hello Mark. Hello Mark, I'm glad your email is still active. Hope this finds you well. I will start with the magician aspect. When we watch them in the ISS, they keep our eyes on all the magic tricks, like a good magician should. They do their sleight of hand and we don't pay attention to the small details. I'm going to go back a little. During the eclipse, there were videos of the ISS seen crossing the sun from one point to another. Measuring that distance and the time it traveled would give us the speed of which it traveled. This should match whatever the big N, oh, NASA, I get it, says it travels. The International Space Station travels in orbit around Earth at a speed of roughly 17,000 miles an hour. That's about five miles per second. This means that the space station orbits Earth and sees a sunrise once every 92 minutes. That being said, why is that... Why is that when we watch the magicians inside doing their tricks, nothing that isn't floating is moving, meaning that nothing moves, shakes or rattles, especially considering how fast the entire thing is supposedly moving. The station is like various Lego pieces connected together, uh, though from the inside, it's like one solid piece that isn't affected by motion and or speed of which it travels. Anyway, that was one aspect that has stood out to me, and I haven't seen anyone point it out. Now, please keep in mind that I know the real answer. I just think it would have been a good thing to point that out if anyone hasn't. I have other major points, but I'll discuss them in another email as not to bombard you with so much in one. Thanks uh, for taking the time. It really helps to discuss this with someone that is aware of the truth. And that's from DL. Uh, I think his handle is CyberSpain. And he's got an L, L address. That's awesome. So, yeah, yeah, I know, I know why. The answer to that question would be because there are no molecules in space. So when you're driving in a car, driving in a boat, or driving or flying in a plane, you're running through air turbulence. And, and even when there's no turbulence, like official turbulence, where you're getting rocked around and you get airsick, uh, you're going through the air. You're, you're pushing through something. And supposedly, if you're on the ISS, you're not pushing through anything. Because space, there's nothing there. It's just the vacuum of space. It's not, it's not that there just isn't oxygen. There's nothing. And it's really hard to describe to somebody if you don't know what I'm talking about. Meaning, the stuff you're breathing right now. Remember, it's four, part ni four parts nitrogen to one part oxygen. It's really kind of a soup. It's kind of like a thin version of water, which is two parts hydrogen to one part oxygen. And, but water is much, much thicker, the, the way they bond. So, but when you're in space, supposedly, or in a vacuum, when you pull, we'll just take out space. If you pull out all those things out of the air, there's nothing. There's no, there's no oxygen, there's no nitrogen, there's no uh, carbon dioxide, there's no monoxide, there's nothing. There's no molecules. And that's very, very different. It's perfectly transparent and it's perfectly empty, but it's also perfectly anti-pressurized, which means that all the other, any other place where the molecules want, are, they'll want to go to, they'll want to rush to. It's the, it's the balance of the pressure, which is why the space station cannot work the way it has. Because remember, outside of that space station, there's no molecules if you believe this and there's tons of molecules inside the space station and the pressure difference would rip that thing apart the seams would be under huge amounts of stress all the time absolutely all the time if you think i'm kidding look up the story about the lady that was sucked out of the airplane window just recently at what thirty thousand feet that's only thirty thousand feet that's uh five miles and change not even six miles up and this thing and that's not not even not even remotely close to a perfect vacuum not even close uh, yeah, you won't be able to breathe. You'll you'll die because there's there's not enough oxygen. But there's something up there, obviously, because the plane can still work. It's still pushing off of stuff. Anyway, don't want to get into it too much. But thank you for that email. All right, this one's called Guild. Mark just finished all of the FE Canada conference. I heard you say that your gaming guild is even called Flat Earth. So I asked myself as a WoW player since uh, Burning Crusade. Now I knew that because he put BC. I wonder if he is talking about Warcraft. So I looked up the guild and lo and behold, there you were. Question, are you recruiting or are you just a group of close friends and or family? P.S. Yes, you and Rob Skiba ruined me as well a few years back, uh, as many have said. And that's from Dennis Beck in Bloomington, Indiana. Uh, yeah, so I do. Have, I, I still play Warcraft. I mean, the thing's been going on for 14 years, which is 
a ridiculous amount of time in, in the gaming world. Most games don't even last six months, and this thing's been going for 14 years. Hey, there's nothing you can even come close, which is amazing for a, a PG, family-friendly, Lord of the Rings-type game. And uh, I wasn't even my idea to do a Flat Earth Guild. It was one of my friends who was, who was into it, um, uh, Brian from Humana Story, who said, I'm going to make a guild, and then I'm going to make you guild leader. It's like, all right, fine, because I'm not a huge fan of guilds. I like doing my own thing. I do Forrest Gump style, you know, just carve my own path, and, and I don't really care. Um, I mean, the guilds are, are fine, but I it just there's a lot of upkeep and a lot of just guild drama I hate. I hate, I hate it. So... I, uh, I, but that's why. So if you if you're in Warcraft, and I, in fact, I put the link to my character at the bottom of every video. If you go into the description box, scroll all the way down, you'll see a Warcraft link. And you click on it, and there, there I am. Uh, but yeah, the guild is called Flat Earth, and I even have uh, some of my pets uh, in the game because I'm a huge pet battle guy. Uh, some of the pets are related to uh, Flat Earth. In fact, my favorite. I'll end it on this because I know you guys don't want to hear me talk about games all day is uh, there's a squirrel, and, and his default name is Nuts. And you can put a title above him. So I said, F-E is not Nuts. There you go. So thank you, Dennis, for getting me into the gaming mode. This one's called Satellites in Space. I don't think so. Hi, Mark. What are your thoughts? I find it almost impossible that thousands of satellites can be up there. All those supposed listening dishes... The list, the listing for it from space. When I'm trying to correct his stuff here, when we know the signal is just bouncing off the dome, and China has built a dish, I think is a mile in diameter. A, a mile in diameter? Uh huh. <laughs> Whatever. A mile wide. Oh, please, you guys know a mile is so huge. It's we don't we don't even have land things that are a mile wide. We've never built anything a mile wide. Sports stadiums aren't a mile... Oh, God, I didn't even want to start. I think it's more like land-based dish positioning, not GPS. And, of course, we have all the cell towers. We know what they're up to kill us with 5G. Eh, I don't know, maybe. I'll send you one YouTube video I saw on the satellites. Thanks again. Your YouTube videos are great. That's from Eric. Thank you, Eric. Awesome. One mile wide. Uh, this one's called No Subject Mark, and just like, and just like was talked in the video, I forgot to attach it. What? All right, hang on, I gotta click on this real quick. It's that's uh, eleven megs. I don't necessarily want to open this. Yeah, don't send me files that are freaking huge unless you tell me exactly what's in it. Sorry, I'm skipping that one. This one's called FE. Hi, Mark. Keep up the good work. Here is one I have not heard covered before. If you built a wall or whatever that was level and plumb, when the earth tilts on its axis, when the seasons change, the wall should go out of level and plumb if the earth is round. Really? Thanks from Mark Hartline. I don't know. Somebody look up. That's an interesting thought. It would probably be done in a 3D modeler. When you when you build a wall, yeah, but w but when do you build it? You have to finish it before the season. And what season? You got to give me a little more details than that because you got to tell me when the wall is done and what season are we talking about exactly? When when will the wall become out of plumb? I mean, it's great, great that you're thinking outside the box. Good stuff. But you got to give me a little more detail than that. I do appreciate the short emails. Uh, this one's called Advanced Powers and Punishment of Humans. Mark, if you read this on your show, my last name is pronounced Bastache, like mustache. Mustache. Bastache. Boss, bastache, like mustache. Okay. You asserted on your Google Gets Clever show that you think the unbelievers will be punished from literally on high, perhaps with bits of falling firmament and a biblical end time scenario. Well, I don't think I said that the firmament was going to be ripped down, but Revelation does kind of talk about it a little bit. I am not a believer in biblical prophecy, but if the engineers of the dome earth are the same beings that supposedly drove us out of Eden and stopped construction on the Tower of Babel, then I could conceive that their jealous, ill-tempered nature, well, I don't know about that, might indeed cause them to rain down chaos on the earth, but they would be doing that as advanced creatures, not as angels, gods, or God. I don't define God as a rewarder of good or punisher of evil through miraculous interventions in a physical world, but 
Be that as it may, if the engineers are aliens but not God, the question then arises as to what interest they could possibly have in their religious opinions of the anti-like humans that scurry around in their giant terrarium. Human behavior could not affect positively or negatively the plans of the advanced aliens who, after all, have total power over the Earth and its creatures. Nor can it be cogently, cogently argued I don't use that word often, often uh, argued that these engineers provided us with moral and religious guidelines through prophets and holy books for the simple reasons that one, there is no convincing evidence of such interventions and two, all holy books are on an even playing ground, none proving better than another. And moreover, they contradict each other, a cluster of misunderstandings that the engineers would hardly have allowed to happen in the first place. Oh, don't be so sure. You throw out a few puzzle pieces in different places and see what happens. I don't, 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 don't sell them short here. So my final thought on this concerns the human inability to do anything to prevent the engineers from simply destroying their terrarium experiment. Perhaps for reasons only known to themselves with a coral, corollary question. Why would we even want to please or influence the engineers since they have hidden themselves from us, leaving us totally vulnerable to their possibly violent intentions toward us? Thanks for reading, Steve Bostash. Like mustache. Uh, yeah, again, the intent, uh, I, I still believe this place is a school more than anything. And I, I don't think we have to please anybody when, when we're doing this necessarily, I, although there's some religions that would argue with me on that i think it's more of a, a a learning process where we're here to learn you know by the time you get to the end now of course everybody makes mistakes along the way have you learned something what have you learned have you learned the difference between being constructive and destructive do you want to build things up or do you want to tear things down uh, and i i think you know through enough time i think really time is the the big answer here because you got to spend some time to learn it wisdom is not just you know something you get overnight once you go through that, then you kind of realize what this place is. It's a place of perspective. It's a place of learning. I, it feels like a school more than anything. I've, I've said years ago that it is. it can only be one of three things. It could either be entertainment, confinement, or education. Really, there's only three things there. Uh, if it's entertainment, then I'll, it seems really bad because not a lot of people are having fun. Most people suffer in one way or another. Uh, if it's confinement... Well, as far as a prison goes, you're, you're, not, you're not showing the bars. And it could be a lot more miserable if it was a prison. And school tends to be a little a balance between both. Sometimes you have fun at school. Most of the time, it, it's, but you are kind of confined, kind of. I mean, there are some guidelines, not necessarily rules, more guidelines. But you're there to learn something. And that's what I've always felt this place was. You're you're here to pick up perspective. You're here to learn. Kind of like uh, if I if I had to do university over again, I would have taken probably as many classes uh, as as I can. Different th than university now, where they just overcharge you for all sorts of stuff, and there's this huge obligation at the end uh, to to do well. I would go and, and audit a whole bunch of classes and and say you know try to figure out uh, university seems to be what what do you like what do you like what don't you like you kind of find out who you are at university you don't you don't find that out in high school uh you find it after high school now if you don't go to university of course you find other things in the real world uh but that's what it kind of feels like to me so anyway there you go uh moving on let's see what's next this one's called questions Hi, Mark. Here's a good one. Oh, I'll be the judge of that, man. Have a physics friend do the math on the supposed core of the Earth. What is being proposed is an enormous mass of an extremely hot magma covering a relatively covered by a relatively thin crust. What would the total thermal energy of such a ball of magma be? Gigantic. How would the thin crust not be consumed in flames? It's just a question of physics. Yeah, good point. Uh, what is the total sum of the supposed thermal energy in the mantle core and what is the supposed mass of the crust? Working this out could be a simple way of exposing the lie. If there exists enough thermal energy in the supposed mantle and core to burn and melt the supposed crust, assuming normal thermodynamic laws of heat transfer apply, then why isn't the crust on fire? Stay well, Chris. Um, and thank you, Chris, from, I believe he's from South Africa. I don't, I think it's mostly 
because they're, they're they immediately come back and say, well, it's cooled enough to where the crust is 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 just cool. And you're thinking, well, okay. And remember, they show the bands of red and orange and yellow and white going all the way down to where it's not super, super hot until you get to the center. But yeah, it still be, should be generating a lot of heat. And of course, which is why I talked about it in the clues, it doesn't make any sense because the deepest hole ever drilled is 8 miles or 12 kilometers, which means everything below that is a complete question mark, utter question mark. And yet they will tell you with certainty that they know what's going, what's happening all the way down. These wonderful, perfectly segmented bands. I think they're like a thousand miles each. It's like, oh, here it is. You know, it's like, really? Nothing else? Nothing? Nothing? Yeah. Uh, this one's called Seen This. Mark, a must see. Alien movements on the moon, up close footage. I don't mind. It's, it's fine. I, I will, you guys can send me links like that. I, I'm not going to give them too much credibility, though. Uh, that's from Dave. Thank you, Dave. Uh, because I've, I, the moon for me is secondary of course it does weird stuff check out the temperature of the moon why the moon is generating a cold light uh why does it why is the eclipse perfect in front of the sun why do we only see exactly one side of the moon it doesn't even change a quarter of a degree in 100 years stuff like that it is a design system it is a clock and clocks tend to give themselves away eventually this one's called, this might be a Flat Earth comic book. Hi, Mark. I took some inspiration from the Flat Earth community to draw this up. I can't say I'm 100% a Flat Earther in my, as my mind changes on most things most days, but I do entertain the idea with great enthusiasm. Keep up the great work. Regards, L. And I think that's Lewis. And he sent me a link to a Flat Earth comic book. Okay, cool. This one's called Flat Earth Questions. And it is loading. Still loading. Why? Why? Why is it? Why is it? Oh, geez. I, I love it that it loads and just sits there and then I only get like two paragraphs. Mark, I'm interested in the Flat Earth debate. The problem I have is that the evidence for Flat Earth is mostly that which requires equipment and or experiments that are beyond cost and scale that the typical people cannot access and therefore cannot duplicate for themselves. There is a phenomena that we experience twice a year that I can only explain with a spherical earth, the shadow path during the equinoxes. No matter where you are in the world or day of the equinox, the shadow tips of a stake in the ground plot to a straight line throughout the day. However, the rest of the year, the tips from a parabola the tips form a parabola. Depending on the distance from the equator, the length of the shadow is longer or shorter, but the shape from plotting the tip of the shadows provides the same results. How can that be explained in a flat earth model? Here's a video explaining that. I was actually looking for a video that just showed someone doing the experiment, but found one from uh, what I discovered at the end of the video was an anti-flat earther. Anyway, this particular phenomenon is the biggest hang-up I have regarding the Flat Earth concept. If you have a way to explain it, I'd love to hear a way to reconcile it. Thanks so much for your time, Sherry. Sherry Gamble. And tips from a parabola, depending on the distance from the aquarium, the length of the shadow is longer or shorter. The shape of the plot of the tip of the shadow provides the same results. I, if, all I can tell you here without looking at too much detail is the when it comes to sticks, the sticks and shadows argument, it is relative, period. You're assuming a giant gas ball that is, what, 400,000 miles wide or something like that, 93 million miles away. But the sticks and shadow argument also works perfectly fine if the object is much, much closer and uh, much smaller. You can, you can test this yourself with just a shadow. Put some sticks and shadows in a light bulb and move it around. And then move the, the light bulb further away. And you can run the test yourself. It's all relative. All relative. You're making massive assumptions on, not you, but, but the experiment is making massive assumptions on the object that's out there. Sticks and shadows works just fine with a very small object that's very, very close. Remember, human beings, and which is why I talked about this in, I believe it was Clue 12, realize where we are maybe genetically designed as such. We are really, really bad at determining the distance and relative motion of objects uh, not not relative motion is a whole nother thing i won't even get into right now but the size of objects so for, for example 
if you take a, a pen and hold it really, really close to your eye, right? Is, and we've done this one since we're kids, right? We, we joke about it. We, it's a film trick you also use. And that is, is the pen really, really gigantic? Is it filling up the entire room? Uh, is it, you know, 20, 50 feet wide? Or is it just really close to your eye? Well, you know that it's really close to your eye because it's a pen. You can recognize it. You take a generic object, like a ball, you know, like not a baseball or a soccer ball, but a generic ball, and you put it off in the distance somewhere with no relative points of reference around it, right? You know, it's, it's kind of tough to find, but you know what I'm saying. And you have a really, really tough time, like a dark room. That's a perfect example. You take a dark room and you put like a glowing ball or a ball with a light on it so far away. Try to gauge how far that is away. And you're saying, okay, I can't envision what you're saying. The, the perfect example there would be the, and I love using this because it's such a fun ride, the Pirates of the Caribbean ride down in Disneyland. Go, if you, if you haven't been, if you're down in California, what I mean is when you get finally to the harbor, they have a ship that's off in the distance, right? They're showing a coastline and there's a pirate ship off in the distance with, with cannons shooting and stuff like that. And it's very, very well done, right? You do not have any idea the way they have the water set up and, and it's dark and, and you don't know where the wall is behind. You know, it's a painted background. You have no idea how far away that ship is. Right? It could be 30 feet, it could be 30 yards, it could be three miles. Now, of course, you're not going to say it's three miles. It's like, well, I know it's a building, so it can't be three miles. The point is, if you didn't know you were in a building, you'd have a really, really hard time judging it because the ship is small and, and how the perspective is set. There's tons of optical illusions along these, these, these lines. My point is the sun and the moon are very small by comparison, and they're very, very close but you were told that they're very large and very far away. Try to think who told you this. Where'd you hear it? There you go. That's my end of that one. This one's called Possible Course. Mark, I have emailed Rob Skiba as well. One course. I am considering developing an adult ed course to be taught in Winchester and Cambridge in Massachusetts after a preliminary trial at Winchester Public Library if I survive the first volley. May I assume, may I, may I use some of your materials? If so, uh, what would you recommend? I'm thinking of the title being something like An Introduction to Antarctica, NASA, and the Theory of the Globe. Two, journal. I find it difficult to go through materials you and others have developed as they are so redundant and garrulous. I have never used garrulous before in my life. Again, if you guys wonder why some words I, I kind of pause on, I, I've made it a rule that if you do not hear the word in mainstream media, it, I'll, I'll just use CNN as an example. If you don't hear the word being used on CNN, I don't use it because it means that 90% of the people in the street have never used it either. And I, I'm a big fan of English, but I, people that go along those, I, people that, that expand the vocabulary that far, it's like, look, who's your audience? Unless you're talking to a very, very select elite intellectual group, you probably shouldn't throw those words out there because you're going to lose stuff in the translation. Anyway. Uh, further, I think r the research should be written up in a scientific journal format. Yeah, see, no. And submitted to existing journals, no. Or, or, or else an FE journal should be published to index, circulate, and discuss research that has been done. We're not there yet. Uh, we still have to get the masses. The masses are the, the people in the street, the huge lowest common denominator that's out there. That has to be hit first. Sorry. Uh, th this is why, by the way, this is why science is losing is because we are hitting the masses. We're out there on the street. We are indoctrinating a whole bunch of people and they can't catch up because of this right there. Science doesn't even know what to do. They don't even know how to address it because they're stuck in this box. A box, by the way, which you are proposing for us. No, I'm not being mad. I'm not getting mad at you. I'm just saying, look what you're doing here. In all due respect for the excellent work done, here we go, with absolutely no offense intended. Ooh, I think it's coming. The current conversation online is somewhat a waste of time, see, for serious researchers. Yeah, I see. And it would repel anyone at university. Yep. Especially undergraduates who have overwhelming course assignments. Yeah. Again, that's why we're going to win. Three, pave pause. Why no discussion that I have seen of the pave pause early warning missile systems? But you go from scientific journal and possibly being published to pave pause. Never even heard that term ever. 
ever. And I know a lot of military systems and I have never heard of that term, but thank you for that. Buildings, number four, build buildings. As an aside, my son is an engineer and a true diehard globalist. And last night he calculated the plumb lines of a building twice the size of McCormick Place, not a quarter, but half mile long, 80 feet high. It's not that high. He calculates that the roof would be a centimeter longer than the basement if the corners were plumbed according to the curvature of the earth. So such edifices evidence neither FE nor globe. Thank you, Joe. I, I don't even know what to do with that last one. Uh, the building, I mean, it's only 80 feet high. I mean, yeah, it's wide. Uh, you, if it was half a mile wide, I mean, it's anyway, it, it's not that big. Uh, it's, sorry, it's not that high and it's not that wide by comparison. I mean, half a mile is not terrible, but it's, it's, you're not gonna, you're not gonna get much there, but thank you. Thank you for the email. And hopefully I, I gave you some constructive criticism. Lord knows you gave us some moving on to, oh, let's just click on this one. This one's called world map spinning spinning come on comcast what's taking you so long it's from philip i can tell you that much and unknown error occurred i don't know what that was okay let's go back to it world map. there it comes up internet computers love them this is called world map hi mark uh me and wife <laughs> me and wife were hiking the famous signal hill trail here in the province newfoundland canada st john's weekend passed and noticed the following map which depicts newfoundland to be the center of flat earth check out the pics i figured you would find this interesting it also said that the uh, Tillengate, Newfoundland is one of four corners of the earth. Fun fact. <laughs> Love your work. Cheers. Yeah. They sent me some pictures of the of the trip they took. Interesting. Some great stuff. And that was thank, sent by Philip Churchill. Thank you, Philip. That's awesome. All right. Let's delete that. And let's go to this one, which is called the Earth's Atmosphere and the Moon. Hi, Mark. I'm just watching your Flat Earth Conference from Canada on YouTube. I am in awe of this. Thank you for such incredible speech on Flat Earth. Thank you. I had a lot of fun. If you guys don't know what we're talking about, the, the opening speech I did at the Flat Earth Conference in Edmonton, Canada. Now, can I add a pointer to the question raised about the Earth's atmosphere directly being held by gravity and not flying out into space? The moon's effect on tides would also pull the Earth's atmosphere in the direction of the moon when passing over the Earth's surface and along its rotational path. I can elaborate if you'd like me to. Not sure if you picked up on this yet, but I thought it might be a nice addition in, to, in response to the question of Earth's atmosphere. Sincere love for you, Mark. I'll take everything you've got. Mike from the UK, and I don't know if he was asking for all the stuff that you because know, I haven't even read a you know thing where people are asking for the survival guide or the the interviews or the twelve questions or the I'm sorry the five questions or the twelve pictures or all this. Anyway, it's Mike from UK. Thank you for that, Mike. And uh, yeah, of course the the moon adds adds to that. the The question I had was, how does the Earth's atmosphere stay on? If the, if you know, they say, oh, it's got to be gravity. And they say, well, because we're still alive, it has to be gravity. Something's holding it down. And it's the only thing we can come up with is gravity. So it's gravity. It's like, N -n 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 -n. that's the only answer they could come up with. Well, unless it's a pressurized and closed system. Well, that's just ridiculous. It's got to be, it's got to be a form of molecular magnetism that's so strong it can hold down the atmosphere, even though there's a bleeding edge to it up at higher altitudes. And then you have the total vacuum of space, which is so powerful, it just should suck all the atmosphere off instantly. Well, yeah, but, but gravity, seriously, the people that, that stutter and then go into that, it's like, yeah, gravity, it's got to be gravity. Ugh. Uh, this one's called Greetings Flat Earther. Mark, hope is hope all is well with yourself. It's a pleasure and would like to thank you for finally opening the final part of my eyes to FE. Your videos are amazing. I'm finally getting the chance to meet other flat earthers in my home city in UK. Just wanting to confirm I have the right email address before sending my questions. Thanks for your time in advance. That's from D Wheeler. Uh, yeah, I think I, I think I wrote them in. Yeah, I responded, didn't I? Yeah, I did. I wrote back and said, yeah, give me your questions. Hopefully we'll see them down the road. This one's called Diabolical Deception. 
Hi, I'm Mark. Love your work on Flat Earth. I would like to bring to your attention a series of videos on YouTube called When the Survivors Awake by New Earth. While Flat Earth deals with recent deceptions, these videos show the deception of our entire history. Yeah, that's good. I would like to hear your opinion. Stay flat. Greg Thomas, and he's from Australia. And I suppose I will have to look these up because he did not send me a link to them, but I will, I will look those up. This one's called... YouTube Senate hearing regarding censorship, hoaxes, and flat earth. Uh, hi, Mark. It's Dalu. Uh, oh, the, the one guy with the license plate, 8P mile 2, license plate guy, which stands for 8 uh, uh, inches per mile squared. Uh, I just saw this on YouTube video this morning, and since it's a relevant topic recently, thought I'd send it your way. Plus, it's short, only two minutes. Stay flat, my good sir. With regards, Dalu. And yeah, 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 the Congress actually had a, a hearing. They were talking about Facebook and social media and stuff like that and, and fake news. And, and they were wondering what to do. And it was interesting because the, the rep from Google mentioned Flat Earth by name. In fact, it was the only thing she really she mentioned by name. Uh, and uh, it's kind of hypocritical because Flat Earth makes YouTube a lot of money because people, from what I understand, on average, the, the stats say they watch like 20 Flat Earth videos in a row when a person f first gets into Flat Earth. That's a lot. Even if the videos are only like 10 minutes long, that's a lot of videos to, to watch in a row. And it's true. We hear this all the time. People that get into Flat Earth, they lose sleep and they just stare at the screen all night and then skip work the next day. This one's called, don't skip work, by the way, just for Flat Earth. Uh, that, that's bad. The, this one's called, please answer on your show. Hi, Mark. I missed you twice. I live in the Palm Springs area and found out you guys were out at the Salton Sea this summer. And I just got back from Calgary, Canada last week. Yeah, and I was just in Calgary. How's that for weird? I was there. You know, I was in um, uh, Edmonton for the conference. And they went to Calgary and went to Banff and, and uh, hung out with some of the speakers there. We, we grabbed a, a giant uh, Airbnb and, and turned it in kind of like a, a real world flat earth thing. Anyways, I'm a Christian and I've been into Flat Earth for a year or so now. As someone who takes the Bible literally, when I first heard about it, it made perfect sense to me and I felt relieved that I now have an alternative to the heliocentric model. In a college geology class, our professor mentioned Flat Earth, saying, I know there's been a resurgence in Flat Earth, but it's not. Trust me. Just like everyone else, he gave no evidence, just that we have pictures of the globe. In that class, we learned about the geothermal gradient, which states that the temperature increases with depth as a result from pressure from outer lane mass of the earth. I question that this is more proof of a flat earth because uh, because of it was a sphere, the pressure would spread outward instead of pushing downward, uh, just like an arch or dome. Think of it. gravity. If gravity is centered in the middle of a ball, it would technically be hollow with the crust acting like a 360 degree dome. Things like the Grand Canyon should technically seal up from the pressure of the land mass around it. Hmm. I had not thought of that. Another note in a flat earth model, wouldn't an airplane have to ever so slightly correct to the left to travel due east or to the right to travel due west, much like it would have to correct downward if it were on a globe. That makes sense to me because I've heard about the argument that sailors use more than 180 degrees in triangulating. But... If they are using east-west lines, they would not be straight lines, and the triangle would look like a slice of pizza, and not a perfect triangle, so the angles would add up to more than 180 degrees. Let me know if you answer the question on your show. I may have already sent you this question, or you may have already answered it. I usually binge watch your show when I get a chance, so I don't always catch every single episode. Tyler. And what he's talking about is the uh, Strange World show that I do on Truth Frequency Radio, which I also put on this um, uh, on YouTube. It's called, uh, usually see SW in front of the name. So SW40 would be Strange World 40. I stopped putting Strange World in the title because YouTube will only let you put so many name words in a title. And so I try to make it a little shorter. Besides, if you, after the first 10 episodes, you know if it's Strange World, right? Uh, and so, geo, yeah, the geothermal gradient, that was, that was the initial question. Yeah. Very interesting, very possible. Yeah, the, there should be a, a difference in pressure. And how uh, how thing the Grand Canyon is an interesting interesting angle. Hadn't even thought of that. The, why not? I, I'm not. I'm again not going to shoot it down. It's an interesting idea. Thank you for for thinking uh, outside of the norm on this one. It's good. This one's called Art of Dino and the Flat Earth. Hey Mark. Oh wow, he sent some funky pictures, and I have not seen any of these things. <laughs> 
That is a lot of color. That it looks like a, an, a like a tropical aquarium just exploded. Whew. There's a lot of a lot of beautiful pictures here. Uh, and I'll, I'll give you the address where you can look look at this. Hey, Mark, love your videos. Have for a while. Also love the flat earth. I'm an artist from birth to death. My mom was a science teacher whose student was a son was son Williams. I don't know who that is. I have grown up surrounded by NASA and space science my whole life, but I've always doubted it and always had the questions that couldn't be answered. I too awoke to flat earth in 2014, but was creating subconscious flat earth art for years before without even realizing my creativity allows me to channel visions and ideas from the ether and put them on paper where they sometimes aren't able to be understood for years. I could go on forever, but I wanted to show you some of my artworks that you may enjoy flat earth based. If there was ever going to be an artist that could take the flat earth and make it accessible to people of all ages, it is me. I am, well, I give him one, that is, he's confident. I am also a teacher and have been teaching children to question the shape of the universe for also many years. That's the main point. No one knows the structure, so we should all be theorizing and talking about it until we figure it out for sure. And our generation will. Let us join forces, Mark. <laughs> Every time I hear that, <laughs> we'll rule the galaxies, father and son. Uh, if you ever want to talk to a flat earth, open-minded artist, please contact me. I would love to. I believe my art visions can affect the masses in ways very little else can. Let's do this. Smiley face. Enjoy these sites and artworks. Thanks, man. Be in touch. Each one is packed with meaning. The second one is the Janiverse. Janiverse, based on the Jainism structure of the universe. So much enjoy. That's from Dino. Uh, okay, so if you want to go to his website, uh, it is artofdino.com. A-R-T-O-F-D-I-N-O.com. And I don't, hopefully it's not case sensitive because he's got like the capital A-R-T, small O-F, and then capital D, small I, capital N, <laughs> small o but i think art of dino will probably work fine and i people in california like doing that i it's a safe bet he's from california right i it's it's always anyone i ever see just start throwing the capital letters in random places in their names it, they're almost always from california so uh yeah check it out if you get a chance and uh, i will look through some of these pictures do not write me and ask for the picture <laughs> because uh, I'm not going to save them in a file. I've already got too much stuff going on. But they are psychedelic, man. You do not want to take drugs and look at these things. <whistles> pretty pretty cool stuff. Okay, moving on. This one's called Q&A. Hey, Mark, it's one of your fave listeners. Sorry about the last email, but I think the short one would be of interest. My dad is an ex-paratrooper, and he told me to tell you whenever he did jump from high altitude, he never saw any curvature whatsoever, as far as he can remember. So what's your thought on this? Yes, I agree. He wouldn't see any curve. Look, most of the unless he's doing like an actual oxygen jump where you're, um, if he's doing high altitude, like what, halo jumps, then uh, what... Um, even then, we're talking less less than 30,000 feet. I suppose they could drop them at 40, but it's not going to be high enough. I know you have spoken to many, many military guys, so maybe you should try and get a paratrooper on who can talk about it. Anyway, keep up your amazing work, and hi to any flat earth era from Glasgow. Regards, John C. O'Neill from Glasgow. I believe that's in Scotland. This one's called Call In. Hey, Mark. Hope all is well, mate. I'll try and call through to the show today, mate. That's from Lincoln. And I'm betting he's down in Australia or New Zealand. And he's talking about the show, Strange World, which is on Tuesday nights at 7 Pacific, 10 Eastern. This one's called Smashing Pumpkins Gone Wild. Mark, please don't read my name on air, okay? Thanks for your work and your videos. Just watched a Joe Rogan show where he interviews Billy Corrigan, Smashing Pumpkins frontman and songwriter. The guy is legit all throughout the interview, which, by the way, I found really interesting. At some point near the end of the show, he uh, asked Billy if he really saw someone shape-shifting. He responded, yes, it's true, and gave me 
the effing creeps. <laughs> Later on, he talks about free speech and how it's being manipulated in alternative media. It starts around 48 minutes. I also think that he paints F.E. when he says, if you know something for a fact, what are you afraid of? Mm. If you could make, yeah, it's a good point. Why, why even address Flat Earth? If, it's, if, if the globe is an absolute fact, why are you attacking Flat Earth? Why? Because hmm? we're giving good people bad ideas, that sort of thing? I mean, that's really the only excuse you got at that point. If you could make a short clip out of it and publish it, that would be great. Movie reference. Anyway, I think it's big and we should make a viral meme out of it. Thanks for your time and shoot me a survival guide if you can. Okay, and I, don't, I haven't written this guy back. If you want, here's the link to the vid. In fact, let me click on it real fast. So at least you guys know what the title of the vid is. The title of the vid is called Joe Rogan Experience uh, 1038 Billy Corgan. And that's from November 10th, 2017. It's got about 1.6 million views. And um, yeah, check it out if you get a chance. I don't know if I'm going to clip it out or not. I've already clipped out plenty of Joe Rogan stuff. Uh, what was the, what was the last part? Oh yeah, it, he mentioned the survival guide. Look, if you want a survival guide, don't put it at the very end of your email because um, you put it in the title, put it in the very fr front line. I'll try to put it in the title if you can, because like this guy, I had not sent him a survival guide, and I could have sent it to him in two seconds. Okay, this one's called Tom from Shelton. Thank you for your Planet X explanation. Mark, new question. Looking at live segmented camera that is on a ship at sea. Uh, live cameras, Oceanus, this early evening. It shows a horizon that is curved. It is a high quality camera mounted on a mast. <laughs> okay, so you got a camera mounted on the mast of the ship. You can see the curve. And yet, we have stuff at 120,000 feet that shows no curve. Which one are you going to believe? It shows the bow of the ship and a vast ocean horizon. It shows definite curvature. Hope you go see also. It is the Earth plane partially domed like that. One flat Earth chunk map, official navy or whatever it is called. With an upturned edge, Antarctica region circular around the plane. Thanks for answer. Caught my last question uh, by luck on 82 Q&A. Look, look, if you see anything, we, and we hear this all the time. I, I don't want to really get into this too much because we've, we've beaten it down so many times. Which is... There are people that will, and, and you can run in all types. They'll say, you can't see uh, the flat earth from, or you can't see the, the curvature from the beach, but you can on a mountain. And people say, oh no, you can't from a mountain, but you can on a plane. Nope, you can't on a plane, but you can from the ISS. The point is, is that everybody thinks at some point or another they've seen the curve somewhere. Now, most of the time, it's because of fisheye lens, otherwise known as a peephole lens, which is used, and you can use it anywhere. You can show the curvature literally six inches off the ground if you use a, a, a fisheye lens, a GoPro camera type thing. And, and I know that you know GoPro cameras come with that default thing because it shows a, a bigger, wider range, but it will curve the ground depending on where, how, how, what the perspective is. So a mast on a ship where, how, sees the curve. And yet we have tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of pictures taken from the beach, live video, not just pictures, live video that show no curve. So which one's right? You gotta, you gotta pick one. They can't both be right. That's what I got. Sorry. There's, there's fisheye lenses and, and we, heck we, we've got the ISS using fisheye lenses. Uh, the, the, the most obvious one, the one I point out, anyone that says that they see the curvature from the beach, I, I, I will gladly, there, you can find them. There's tons of, of weather balloon footage, which shows it flat. Uh, but the Felix Baumgartner Gardner footage, the, the Red Bull jump, which was beautiful. Because, you know, he didn't jump that far up. He was only at 120, 130,000 feet. And yet the curvature of the Earth from the outside of that capsule was so extreme that apparently the Earth was only as big as Arizona. So unless you can resolve that in your mind, there's not much I can do for you. Uh, this one's called... Somebody shared me a photo... Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So Jeffro Flat, that's his name, sent me a, a Google photo. And I don't know if I've actually, if I actually put this in the thing yet. You know, I should download this. It's, uh, unless I have, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to download it. It's basically a tattoo 
uh, going to do on his foot in about 10 minutes. And there's the purple outline. He was going to put, a, he's going to put an AE map on his foot. It's kind of veiny and stuff, but I'm going to save that. And then he sent me another one. Put that in my things to do pile. And he sent me another one, which is a title of do the laws of gravity apply to water in pipes going uphill? And that was a question he put on Quora. And the answer was gravity is lawless. It can do anything and everything it wants to, no matter what the laws are at hand with no consequences or repercussions, thus making gravity lawless. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Gravity is the answer to, to everything. And again, it's only going to go so far. Gravity doesn't, doesn't uh, address most of the issues we bring up. Uh, this one's called taking the curve. Uh, you're in this documentary along with others from the 2017 conference. It's in IMDb. There is a video out there called Taking the Curve. I'm looking on IMDb. Flat Earth, is it a myth? More proof than ever before, technology sometimes provides us with answers to life's greatest mysteries. Before the modern era of science, the Earth was thought to be a flat surface mile, miles across. Were we right? And I do not see anything... Release September, release date is September 9th, 2018. Never saw it. Didn't hear anything about it. Nobody sent it to me. I uh, haven't heard anything. I, I can tell you that behind the curve, the documentary, if I can close this. Uh, thank you for that, Rob. The, the uh, behind the curve, the documentary, you can go to behindthecurvefilm.com. That is the first mainstream documentary on Flat Earth. It is not pro-Flat Earth. Anybody that's been in Flat Earth longer than three months, it is going to tick them off to no end because it addresses both sides. It is a fair look of what we were doing in 2017. Does it show Jaron muffing two different experiments? Yes, it does. Does it show Bob from Globusters not doing that well with the gyro experiments? Uh, yes, it does. Uh, does it talk to an astronaut and a couple scientists and a, and a psychologist? Yeah, it does. But are we in about 75% of the movie? Yeah, it follows uh, several flat earthers, including myself, around in different places around the country. And then it culminates at the conference in Raleigh last year. And it's an interesting look at flat earth. It shows the people. Look, I know the director. I spent a lot of time with him in 2017. He's a good guy. He's a straight shooter. He's not, he's not there to tear apart flat earth. He wants to show it at what as how he sees it, which is interesting. And it, it, it does that. I, I will say, it is, is it a rah, rah, go team Flat Earth movie? No, it is not. Will it get people interested in Flat Earth? Yes. Will it get people talking about it? Oh, you bet they will. And it will inspire a whole bunch. And it has already. Uh, it has inspired a whole bunch of other producers to look at this thing and try to see what they can, what they can do. Well, you know, a lot of the producers, of course, it's all about money. Uh, but it, it exposes Flat Earth and puts it out there to the public consciousness. Uh, that's what it's about. And there are four more documentaries that are going to follow this almost immediately. Uh, I'm happy to have been part of the behind the curve thing. You know, I didn't get paid for it. It was just something I wanted to, wanted to do, and I represented Flat Earth as best I could. Uh, same with everybody else in it, and it's good. It's a, it's it, it, Again, you show us the average person on the street, they all have the same reaction. Wow, really interesting. And the my favorite story about this, I, I got to tell it real quick. This will give you kind of an idea, which was the editor showed it to another editor in Hollywood and it, without telling him anything about it didn't even didn't tell him anything about how it was shot and who was involved and the guy watched the entire thing at the end he's going wow he's what kind of what kind of budget he goes where'd you get all the actors where where'd you get all these you know how because he thought it was a, a piece of docufiction where which is different if you guys don't know the difference between a mockumentary and you will hear that film that you will hear that term thrown out a lot a mockumentary is when you take professional actors and you take a, a real topic at, like a like a dog show or um, like a, like a best in show or a mighty wind. The director of that is known for making high, high end uh, mockumentaries where you take professional actors, and you put them in a real scenario like a dog show or a folk singing convention convention and you you have them play it up you know it's a little tongue-in-cheek that's a mockumentary you, you're kind of mocking a real topic now docufiction is is different and that is you have actors but you have them playing completely straight nobody cracks a joke you play it completely straight there is no there is no tongue-in-cheek uh and anyway so th this particular editor saw this film and he thought it was a piece of docufiction he's going wow 
he's going, this is, that was incredible. I, everyone was, was spot on. You couldn't, you know, everyone, it, it looks so real. Right. And, and the editor is like, yeah, it's because it was real. And that's when it floored him. He's going, wait, that, that convention happened. That actually was a thing. Yeah, that actually was a thing. So that's, that's what I want. I, I want the, this documentary again. I know everyone that's listening to this is going to eventually watch it. And you're going to be like, oh, because it's so angry. You know, but it shows Flat Earthers doing some bad things. Yeah, it does show some Flat Earthers. It shows the dissension in the ranks, which we still have to this day. It shows experiments that go wrong, which, as you know, we, we screwed up all sorts of experiments. But you learn from doing, you know, there's no there's no book on this. There's no we have no rule book on how exactly to, to do experiments. We're, we're kind of making it up as we go along. And it shows all of that. It's an honest look at us in 2017. We are much better than a year later now, and we are much better than we used to be, and what much bigger, and everything is getting cooler and slicker. And and you'll know, you'll see that at the Denver conference, which is coming up in six weeks in Denver, Colorado. Check it out, fe2018.com. All right, enough of that. Let's get. I think we have time for two or three more. This one's called Coast to Coast Interviews and Survival Guide. You guys know about this one. Mark, please send me the Coast to Coast interviews and survival guide. Thanks. Uh, and keep up the amazing work. The masses are starting to wake up. That's from Jeremiah. And yes, anyone wants a survival guide, all you have to do is send that in an email and I will I will shoot it to you. It's only two megs. It's free. And the Coast to Coast interviews I have to send through uh, WeTransfer, uh, but it's easy enough to, to send it like 100 megs. Uh, and that's because YouTube, uh, Coast to Coast, is, was out of all the interviews, they were the only per people that actually had me sign a release form that says I couldn't put them up on YouTube. Otherwise, they'd strike me. And I was like, okay, fine. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I won't do it. So I've got the raw audio files. If you want to listen to it? That's fine. Uh, this one's called 10,000 Kilometers of Flat. And it's from Lulidja. Lidja Hook, and the video is called World's Biggest Mirror. It's the Uni Salt Flats in Bolivia. Yeah, it's a beautiful, uh, that's from uh, Kara and Nate. And yeah, it, it's, a, it's a great, if you guys have never looked up the uh, Salar del Uni uh, Salt Flats in Bolivia, it's amazing. I mean, that, that alone proves flat Earth, in my opinion. Even though uh, the scientists will say, well, no, it's just a really, really flat 100 miles <laughs> square chunk of salt flats. Uh, and and that's just a flat part on a round Earth. It's like, really? It's perfectly flat, you know? You know and you can tell this because when it, it rains every once in a while, it's different from like the, the, the salt flats in Utah where you get like half inch of water. And it turns into this giant mirror. It's one of the most beautiful places I've ever I've ever seen photographed. Uh, and anybody that's ever going to do a a flat Earth show or anything, you should culminate the season finale there, uh, because it's just gorgeous. I mean, Antarctica, yeah, of course you could go out down, down there, but it's it's visually nothing compared to this, uh, because Antarctica is just a just a big chunk of white, whereas this is a big mirror and it's beautiful clouds. Seriously, look up the pictures if you get a chance. Uh, okay, this one's called One Argument. Dear Mark, there is only argument that keeps popping up in my head after reading and watching so much material about the flyer theory, which is related to the large number of international and national companies that launch communication satellites into space that we can use for communication. How can private companies and their employees either deliberately or undeliberately do this unless they are also aware of the flat earth model? Many of these satellites fall back to earth a few years later. Thanks, GWS. Okay, you know, maybe we should end on this one because it's going to take me a minute to answer it. Satellites. Do I think there's some satellites up there? Yes. Yes, I do. Do I think they are put up on rockets? No, I don't. Look at the high altitude research pro projects by NASA, which have been going on literally since NASA was founded uh, in the late 1950s. Uh, look up in the, and you'll see some fantastic footage. We can send using, I think, hydrogen instead of helium because it has uh, much more lift. I think we can, the biggest payloads we can take up there are like four tons, which is 8,000 pounds, way bigger than you could ever put on top of a rocket. 8,000 pound satellites, that's ridiculous, that's a huge amount of weight that, that you can put up by balloon. Why would you ever use rockets for anything? Uh, except for, of course, in the ISS, but that's a money sink for a whole nother discussion. Uh, but are there things up there? You know, yes, I do. Uh, do I think there's things up there? You bet. Uh, do I think they are put up there by rockets? Nah. Now, why do it? Uh, look up stuff 
that is put up by, of course, there's all sorts of space groups, but NASA was the one, the Americans and the Soviets back in the 60s, they were the ones that blueprinted the whole thing. They showed countries how to do it. Does this mean that hundreds of thousands, if not billions of people are in on it? No. Not at all. And I, you've heard this story from me before. One of my next door neighbors when I was living in Boulder, his name was Wayne Ottinger. He literally lived right next to me. We shared a wall in this triplex, which was weird. Uh, and that was, he, he was like the NASA engineer. He knew all the astronauts from Mercury, Mercury and Gemini and Apollo. He knew them all on a first name basis. His pl walls were just covered in plaques. He was the ultimate wrench turner, the ultimate garage mechanic for NASA. Did he know anything? No, he did not. Because why? Why would he? Why would he? All you have to do is you have everyone, if you if you have any doubt what I'm saying, watch the movie Capricorn 1. Late 70s, independent film, great cast, including O.J. Simpson. Go figure it. One of his only serious roles that, that he ever did. Um, where... It, they they were faking the Mars um, a Mars mission, and the only guys they had to tell were the telemetry guys, a select group of software guys that controlled the telemetry data. That's all you need to know. That the, the, anyone else, the wrench turners, the people that build every the systems, the guy that sit there in the control panels, most of the control panels, they don't have to know anything. In fact, you don't want them to know anything. This is an object. Uh, this is a great lesson in compartmentalization. This is a great lesson in need to know which is if they don't need to know you don't have to tell them because ignorance is bliss and they can go about their lives and and doing stuff and and everything seems perfectly normal why would you have anything way on their on their minds why and so no when it comes to satellites even the people that build the satellites they don't know all you have to do is have somebody because which is why when I uh, I'll end it on this I, I got to do this real quick the um, the company that I talked to a couple of years ago uh, at the um, uh, interorbital the people out there when they were saying that before you launch any rocket you have to register with the atmospheric and transportation safety bureau and every country that has a space program has this and you have to tell them in advance months and months in advance every little tiny detail about your rocket the payload, the dimensions, the trajectory, everything about the telemetry, which is basically you're giving them the excuse. And so when the rocket gets up out of visual range, you take over telemetry. Uh, if, it, if the rocket isn't remote controlled, fine, you know, but you, you make sure you know exactly what you infiltrate. You, you, te you send that rocket out into the drink, you sink it, and then you send them the data, uh, you know, via landlines, anything that you want. That's all there is to it. It's not that hard. And that way you keep very, very small amount of people in the loop. Sounds crazy? Yeah, I know. But so is Flat Earth, right? And yet here we are. Three years later, it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. <sighs> anyway, does that mean, uh, my, my, my final thought on this, does this mean that the world is absolutely perfectly flat the way I say it is, that it's an enclosed system? No, no, it doesn't. Does it mean that it's a globe though? Yeah, nobody's going back to the globe. That's the one thing I love about Flat Earth. That's why in the movie, in the documentary, uh, we, I talk about that it's the Scottish Highlands. Everybody's got their own slightly different idea of what exactly the world looks like and how exactly it works. But everybody, everybody in the community is agreed on one thing. It is not the globe, never was, and you're never going back. Can't. You took the red pill. You can't go back even if you wanted to. Every time you watch a space thing, you're just going to just go, oh, I hate this. Find me, find me somebody that went to flat earth, who, who went, who, who left and now is back in the globe camp. Find me somebody. And Tiger Den doesn't count. Anyway, that's it, guys. Thank you much on this Sunday for listening. Uh, email your stuff to msargent23 at comcast.net. That's uh, M-S-A-R-G-E-N-T 23 at comcast.net. Until next time, guys, stay flat.